Is you sure? Okay. So Peter's being recorded. So I'll, I'll put it up here. Votre Sante. Two thousand nine. I did went very well with So what do we start with that? That's pretty good. How do you want to start? No, I I, j I will just talk and a, a little bit ramble. No, it makes it inter it makes it interesting that that way. We should have um, as your wine goes through. The you recording. can you can edit it. No, but it's nice to have um, a format. Like I mean, categories like um, no, in my childhood. That's what I'm saying. Childhood, <laughs> you exactly, and I mean, early adulthood. Okay. Just shut off. You did? Yeah. No, it doesn't. It, the, the screen just goes dark. It's still going. Oh. Okay. So start with childhood. No, I, I, I was... My name is Peter Fonce Kerr, and I was born in on 19 June 1935 in the middle of, of the, the Depression in, in America. Uh... I was born in the Staten Island Hospital, which is now um, moved to the South Shore. What was it called? The Staten Island Hospital, and that's where Lydia trained as a as part as part of her nursing program. Hmm. And uh, I was brought home to seventy four Bond Street. Now, which is in Port Richmond, Staten Island. And <clears throat> in those days, what's interesting to note is the house, because it was the middle of the Depression, mm -hmm. the house was owned by my grandmother's sister. Oh. And I don't know this as a fact, but I can suppose my father paid no rent <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because it was, nobody had any money. And in those days, and um, sometimes he, he was, he treated patients for nothing, and sometimes patients paid him with, ch with chickens. Mm -hmm. No, you know, the, the money was not av available. What was your first memory? In my first memory um, on Bond Street, well, well, wait a minute. First, I have to notice, note this. The children of, of my father's siblings, he had an, uh, an older sister. She did not live in Port Richmond at, at the, in those years. She lived, she married Remington Scott, and she lived on, um, I forget, it was near the Staten Island Zoo. Uh -huh. um, I forget the name right offhand. But the other siblings, the, the uh, two brothers or three brothers of my father all lived in Fort Richmond within walk easy walking distance of each other's house, houses. Who were they? <laughs> I mean, Ken. The, my father was the oldest brother, and he his sister Constance lived on. Now I remember the name Colonial Court. I think it was Forty Eight Colonial Court. Mm -hmm. And it was near the Staten Island Zoo. And then came my father, who was born in 1900. And then came, uh, and he lived on Bond Street, where, in which house I spent my first three or four years. Mm -hmm. And um, then came uh, uh, Kenneth, who was born in 1903. And he lived on Hebberton Avenue, where the original Kerr house stood, and it stood there until perhaps 1990, and then it was, it was burned down by vandals, I think. Hmm. And um, then there was uh, Norman Kerr, who was a dentist, and he lived on 209 Park Avenue. 
And then there was the youngest brother, Kingdon, uh, and he lived on, I think it was 348 Heberton Avenue, and his ha house was owned by uh, um, another sister of my grandmother's. And my, my grandmother, Madeline Marie Bailey Kerr, owned a lot of ha different houses on Staten Island, and that helped the Kerr income uh, because she collected rents from those houses. How many did she have? Maybe four or five. So who inherited them? I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. If they were sold probably during the Depression. But I were, what I remember from this house that I was brought home to in 1935 from the hospital is that... Um, there was a Mrs. Drucker who lived on that street, and that was a friend of, of my mother's, and I don't know her background or anything about her. And then there was a dog, Mike. We had a dog called Mike, and I, try, I remember trying to ride him as a horse. <laughs> and the dog always wanted to run out the front door, <laughs> and nobody could find Mike. And then I had an older brother, Billy, who was born in 1932. <clears throat> and we played together in the backyard, and we had a cousin. On Bond Street? That, no, lived on Hemberton Avenue, that was the first though, daughter of, of Kenneth. But when did you move from Bond Street to... No, I'm going to get into that. Don't, you're trying to steer me. And, <laughs> and uh, so... Patsy would come over. I have pictures of Patsy, Billy, and I playing. Patsy? The, co the cousin. Oh. The, daughter, the first daughter of Kenneth. Oh. And he lived around the corner of Hamilton Avenue. So all these brothers, what I'm trying to say, all these brothers and sisters lived within easy walking distance of each other. So that's, that's very European. Yeah. European, like it's like Lydia's family today in Germany. You know that they they live oh like it's like Cordula, Lydia's sister Cordula. Mm -hmm. They the children don't move far away from the 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 birth house. Did did the brothers Kenneth and your father ever think about having their own practice together? No, they were very different. <clears throat> I I heard this from my old Alsa Alsatian aunts, one of whom was my godmother. And my godmother, I, never, I, I can't get over that to this day. Imagine my godmother was born in 1864 <laughs> in Greenwich Village. The Civil War, Kathy. Yeah. The the Civil and her name was Elizabeth Miller. And everybody called her Lied, you know, from Elizabeth, Lizzie. Oh, Lied is short. Well, it was a nickname for Lizzie. Lizzie and or I, and she was my godmother. Was she the one who stole money? No. You're you're trying to go, you know, rush ahead. No, no, I couldn't remember. <laughs> it's better if I ramble on. So anyway, what's interesting is that these children all kept together, even though one. One was a, a, my father was a dermatologist, and his brother Norman, Norman Milliker was a, a dentist, and uh, Kenneth was a pediatrician, so they, they could easily support each other. But how, how long that did that last? I think in the 1940, they they started to move away, One. you know, the different parts. Well, you know, the neighborhoods go downhill, and they look, were looking for better neighborhoods, better schools, and that kind of stuff. Who moved the farthest away? Kenneth moved out, way out to Tottenville. Still on Staten Island? Yeah. But they all like Staten Island? And we moved to West New Brighton.
But I, I in the at the house on Bond Street, I remember my, a little train that my mother had. It came from her house and not my father's house. And it, it, it was green, and it ran around the Christmas tree. And and it was, she had the Christmas tree in a bay window. Does everybody know what a bay window I is? Have you have one? Really? Yeah. In, in your house? Yeah, in my room. Oh, okay. And I remember that, and Mike, the dog, and let's see, what else? And my, my great-grandmother died in this house. But 1924, before I was born, in, in 1935, she died there. Let's see, who else? And her mother was French, and she came from Alsace. And the father was German. He was a jeweler, and he came from Klopenheim by Wies... It's near Wiesbaden in Germany. So, so that for, 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 and then we moved to Morrison Avenue uh, around 1940 mm. or 39. And because of Franklin Roosevelt, who was the president at that time, started to build up because he could see that the war in, you know, in, in, in had started in Europe. In 1939, September 1st, when Germany invaded Poland, and then uh, the relationship with Japan was not exactly friendly, and so the economy improved as war production started, and so people started to have more money, and in 19 around 1940 or 39, we moved to Morrison Avenue which was just opposite kind of, uh, I think PS, it was called PS Public School 45, and it was in West New Brighton. And that house was like, a, my father referred to it as a dollhouse. It was very small. And my youngest brother, Thomas Kerr, was brought home from the hospital to that house on Morrison Avenue. It's still there, it's a, it's a small, brick house and we stayed there maybe two or three years I think in around 1941 or 42 we moved to Kings 265 Kingsley Avenue and that house is still there and we stayed there about I stayed there about 21 or 22 years I went I stayed there in grammar school high school and college and graduate school when was it sold? 1961, I think, Dorothy sold it when she married Lou Foote. So it was in your family from 1940 to 1961? Yeah, kind of like that. 20 years. 21 years, yeah. And, uh, let's see. Did your father eventually buy it? Because you said he rented it for a long time. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, we can start at that house. We had um, we, it was the gardener. Irving Irving Braced the gardener. You ready? Yeah. Ir, Irving Braced it with my mother employed very many people. Uh, at this house on 265 Kingsley Avenue. And um, was first was... Er huh? Was it considered like a high-end place to live when you... Oh, yeah. It? it was all professional people. Okay. We had three ministers, a Dutch Reform minister, oh. and, you know, a Unitarian minister. And, and we, we even had a, a, a gangster once that lived on the top of Kingsley Avenue. Oh, really? <laughs> Mafia? No, he he was he was a, a kind of a comical gangster. Like he he was interesting for the people to read about in the newspapers because oh. he was he had kind of a sense of humor and he never murdered anybody. But I forget his name offhand. Mm. But we had everything on Kingsley Avenue. Mm. Um, 
Let's see, what are we on our list? We, 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 uh, my mother, as I said, in, employed several people, which added to the comical situation of the family because people would, um, they all had relationships outside of the house. One, one had a, a boyfriend, mm -hmm. and my uncle would come over and dance around the, the kitchen floor with her. <laughs> the, the whole house was known to be uh, known for its comedy <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and great conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Irving Braisted was the gardener. Then there were two two people that only did ironing all day. <laughs> oh Jesus! <laughs> Nicholas, you're gonna kill me. It's I, funny. Normally, most families people say "God bless you." Here, it's like Jesus. <laughs> get get out of my get out of most my. Most families say "God bless you." <laughs> So anyway, the two Earl, uh, two Arnie women was Mrs. Early, and she was a very Irish type of woman, and Mrs. Um, I forget the. It was a black woman, Mrs. I can't remember her name, and then we had, the, and then we had Christina, who was the cook and house cleaner, and she came from an Italian family in Port Richmond. She came every day. Yeah. And my, my parents would typically go shopping at 10 o'clock in the morning. Then they would come back and have this elaborate luncheon, like, like During the lobster tails, and, you know, it was a sumptuous luncheon. And we came home from school, from the public school, and had to eat a full, a full like, dinner, luncheon, and then walk back to, this, to the grandma. It was, it was completely crazy for children because it was too, uh, much too much food, mm -hmm. and we never had enough time. And, and it, it, you know, eating, e eating such a big lunch mm -hmm. made you fall asleep in the school. <laughs> and then my father's brother would come over during the day. He was a drug salesman and a king, and he would dance around the kitchen with uh, Christina, and one time they knocked over the bird cage, and the bird died, and... My mother got upset, and it, it was a, a kind of a, 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 a not a usual household. It was very, it was full of comedy and, and uh, playing pranksters on the people that well, were Could you imagine when you moved in the house, your dad would be dead 10 years later? That's almost no. incomprehensible. No, 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 right? no child thinks that way, mm. I think. No, but it, but it, but in in back of the house was the old Benedict estate, and the Benedict family made watches until the depression, and the depression put them out of business. Mm -hmm. And and uh, one of the granddaughters of of old man Benedict, I went to school with. Her name was Nancy Bloomore, and one house on the estate still existed, and we used to play out there one day. This Nancy, her name was Nancy Bloomore because her, mar her, her mother, Benedict, married somebody by the name of Bloomore. And she, she said once this whole estate belonged to her family, and I didn't quite believe it. And she said, come on home with me and I'll show you pictures of how it once looked. And, it, and, it, and it, I, I, I didn't go with her because I wasn't interested in girls at that age. And um, but I saw later pictures of the of the estate, and it was truly beautiful. It was like ten acres or something. So and that was our playground. We we climbed trees and we played cowboys and Indians, you know, with cap pistols and and um, uh, let's see, we we slay we slept at once. Uh, sleigh riding in the back because there was a big hill down to Jewett Avenue and uh, it was a great place for kids, you know, to play. And there were all kinds of, in the springtime... When you were a kid that age, did you ever head over to Manhattan with the family for like an evening dinner or did you rarely go to Manhattan? Oh, sure, because my father, my father went to high, high school 
college and medical school in Manhattan. So, you so he knew him. And, and you have to remember, his mother, even though she was from the Fountain family on Staten Island, the, or Fontaine family, she was, part of her was French. But did your dad ever take you to Columbia and show you around? Oh, yeah. Oh, he, he did? He did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How was that? Do you remember that? Like, is it he never time? took us to the medical school, but he took us to the college. When? When you were like 10? No, f- probably 44, 45. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he, he knew... Uh, and you would have taken the ferry. He but, did. No, I mean you when you went. Oh, with I him. did. Yeah. For, when you went with him, I mean for, he took you and the family to. Oh him. sure, yeah, the Staten Island ferry. It did, today they don't allow cars on the ferry anymore because they're afraid of explosives and explosives and terrorists. You know, but in those days. Yeah, but you can take the bridge now to Staten Island. Yeah, you can do that, but it's it's very long. It's it's often congest congested. I did that with Andrew. Who was your first girlfriend? Well, let me tell you about Kingsley Avenue a little bit. So, um, <laughs> we had piano lessons, but nobody, nobody. You took except, piano lessons? Yeah. Wow. We had a piano t- teacher that came to the house once a week for two or three years. But um, the only person that had any talent uh, was Billy, my older brother. Is this Jim? No, I'll pause it. I'll pause it. I'll pause it. Who? Well... Yeah, he's, he's, we're going to continue. Go ahead. Well, then uh, World War II came along, and that, that was... I mean, the biggest thing in my childhood was <clears throat> World War II. That changed the whole way of, yeah. of, of life. And um, as far as the family members went, Norman was in the Navy as a medical officer or as as a dentist, and um, he was sent to the Philippine Islands and then Australia, and uh, Kenneth was a medical officer in, uh, in North Africa and then in Italy. And, uh, but uh, the, 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 the really interesting thing for a child was uh, the measures they took to... Uh, you know, on, uh, during the war on Staten Island, they they painted half of the street lights black mm-hmm. so that they wouldn't show so much in the dark. Mm-hmm. And uh, every, food was rationed. You had a ration book, True. and you were only allowed to buy so much food mm-hmm. and so much meat or chicken per week. And um, uh, they moved children from England over to New York City because of the. German bombing raids on, in, on London and mm-hmm. other parts of England. And one day I, I, I went to school and there was, there was a little girl sitting next to me and she had such a, a, a strange accent and it was an English accent. And uh, her name was Shirley Zipper. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she stayed, she stayed like two years with us until the end of the war and then she went back to England. Was she cute? Yeah. She looked like Natalie. <laughs> and uh, let's see what else happened. Well, we all graduated from PS30, uh, public school, grammar school. Yeah. And um, because my mother came from Philadelphia and Camden, New Jersey, we went on uh, visits down to the house she she grew up in, which had, which that was in uh, Haddon Heights, New Jersey, mm-hmm. and she went to uh, 
drama school there or in high school, and she graduated from Haddon Heights High School in 1925. Wow. And she was quite athletic for a girl in those days. She played basketball, and she had a boyfriend all through high school. <laughs> His name was Harvey. Harvey. Harvey Dent. No, Dempsey. Harvey, Harvey yeah. Dempsey? Yeah. yeah. I, I, he was very good looking. And but somehow she did she didn't marry him and then when Why? she was she I don't know. And when she was eighteen or nineteen or something like that, she was in on in an automobile accident and it it crushed her nose, so her nose had to be remade, but mm. and they did a half half job on it and she, but she never looked the same again. Why did her, he, she and Harvey break up? No, I don't know. Whatever happened to him? He became a doctor. Did he? Yeah. And, and then all the sisters, uh, let's see, one sister, Thelma, went to Hahnemann Hospital Nursing School, which is in Philadelphia. They also have a medical school, and her father graduated from the medical school, Dr. Fawns. And uh, but Dorothy went to New York City. She she was an an adventurous, and um, she went to Flower Fifth Avenue Hospital, which nursing school, oh, which nursing doesn't school? exist anymore. Really? No. Huh. And um, was she a good student? I don't know. I mean, she passed the boards, the nursing boards in New York State, which were considered to be among the best in the nation, you know, the nurses training at that time. Today they have bachelor's degrees in nursing and even master's degree, like Lydia has a master's degree in nursing, which is a very a practical profession for women because they can work nights or you know they they can work any any of the three eight hour shifts, so it's very flexible. It's practical, and and today a nurse in a a major hospital in, in the operating room they can make up to a hundred thousand dollars a year. Can you imagine? Yeah, it's a it's a very good profession, and. Um, but after my father died in, in May 1951, she went back to nursing and she did special duty nursing and did quite well in those days. You know, but, but she worked seven days a week and then she would go on vacation trips with a cousin of my father's. How'd she meet your father? She, she met him in an elevator in, in Fifth Avenue, uh, Fifth Avenue, hospital in Manhattan because he was an intern. There. What's the hospital called? Flower Fifth Avenue Hospital. Oh, okay. But I think it, it merged with another. Okay. But they had a nursing school? On yeah, top of Flower Fifth Avenue. And he used to teach in the nursing school. Really? Yeah. He taught pharmacology. You know, like how many ounces you put in this glass and that, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so what happened in the elevator? Did they just introduce to each other? Well, I think if you want to know an interesting story, my first girlfriend, Sue, had an aunt, like her, her father's sister. Mm -hmm. And she knew Dorothy at this Fifth Avenue hospital. She was there about at the same time, okay? And her, what did I call her, aunt? She was around with her two daughters and it's like two families that can't get away from each other <laughs> there's some kind of an attraction <laughs> it's the strangest story on earth and um, I forget what her name was aunt I used to call her aunt something and she was always in the house for a cocktail and if, if we rented a, a beautiful a mountain lodge mm -hmm. in like Lake Erskine, New Jersey, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that whole family came with us. It was like, you know, like a dual family. 
was like like a Gregory situation. <laughs> it was kind of kind of interesting. And uh, I can't remember her name. And something. Anyway, it was my first girlfriend was Suzanne, and I never made the connection late when I first met Sue. I never made the connection be, that she had an aunt that I already knew from from mm. from six or seven years earlier. Mm. And you know, I have pictures of her two daughters mm -hmm. coming to my birthday party, mm. and we used to race around with cap guns, you know, and through through the house. I mean, yeah, rubber band guns. And the, the, their parents were quite uh, tolerant. I mean, the kid. The, the kids were running all over the place because we had a big backyard on Kingsley Avenue and then behind beyond that was the the Benedict Woods, you know, the, the estate. So it was a fun place for kids and and there are photographs in, uh, in the albums, the old albums of, the, of those birthday parties and all the kids that came there. But... Um, I'm trying to think of the name of Suzanne. I can't think of the name. What was it? Aunt so and so. Anyway, she had two daughters, and one daughter, Jessie Lynn Forrest, that was their last name. She married a man by the name of Forrest. And she had two daughters, and Jessie Lynn Forrest married my first cousin, Bruce Kerr. You see? And uh, her uncle was Vaughn. And the girl I went out with, my first girlfriend, was Suzanne Vaughn. So the girl that Bruce married was the first cousin to my old girlfriend. But I think that my father knew Jesse Lynn's forest mother in, in the nursing school, mm. you see? And I, I think they may have been, you know, I don't know, you know, adult girlfriend and boyfriend, maybe, because she was very pretty. And then along came Dorothy and knocked, I, I think this, I don't know it factually, I think that Dorothy knocked her out of the picture, mm. you see? <laughs> And, and 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 then later when Dorothy and, and and my father had children, they renewed the relationship. I mean, they, you know, they, it was like an old friend. Mm -hmm. And um, did she get married? It, but she never. He never amounted to anything, and they both ended up alcoholics. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I th I think he he was a floozy woozy, the guy she married. And but how did they? How, how did they? I mean, elevator. How did come? they hook up again? Yeah, because you have to get. Because some they were all from Staten Island. Not Dorothy. No, not no, her. But how did they? I mean, when's the first time they went on a date? How did they get each other's numbers? I don't know. I that I don't know. But I know that these children were all. Right. And the story I heard from Dorothy was she walked in a room somewhere, and my father and this woman. You know, Jesse's mother from the nursing school mm. were holding hands, mm. and I never saw her again. <laughs> <laughs> That's how life is. <laughs> from a child's point of view, you know, people come, people come and people disappear, <laughs> and you never know. You know, you know. We say, what happened to Uncle Jake? You know, well, he, he shot and killed somebody, and they hung him in Arizona. <laughs> It was a funny... But, you, but your dad probably married Dorothy because she was strong and athletic, right? I think... I, mean, because, she had all I think I, I, I asked them that once. And I said, well, you know, they had another friend like this. And I, I said to my father one day, I said, how come you didn't marry that woman? And she said, she, he said, she's not stable. Uh -huh. Dorothy I, was stable? I think that's right. And he said to me, 
when her sister died in 1942, March of 42, Dorothy's sister, Thelma, and she was very gifted. Actually, she played the violin. I, can't, I remember her. Really? Yeah. It was my favorite aunt. So Dorothy was very stable for your dad. I asked him once. He said to me, he, I was 12 years old, and he, we, we got on the train in Elizabeth, New Jersey, mm -hmm. just, just opposite, across the bridge from Staten Island, and it took us to Wilmington, Delaware. And I took that train so many times, I knew all the conductors, you know, like, and all the conductors were black, black men, you know. All aboard! You know? <laughs> and during the war, you know, she died in 42, so it was during the war, the trains were full of soldiers. And I remember staying in one of uh, Dorothy's older sisters. They lived in Haddonfield, New Jersey, and and the Pennsylvania Pennsylvania Railroad went right through Haddonfield, New Jersey, and I saw all these soldiers, you know, in the windows, and I I I, I understood. I was like ten or eleven years old in those days, you know, or eight or nine, and I I thought they, a lot of them are going to their death, you know. But it was it was train. You can't imagine the, the number of trains and soldiers and sailors. And at one time, I sat on a whole a frozen turkey all the way down to, to to Wilmington, Delaware. You know, Dorothy sat in the in the dining car, and they always have these whiskey jiggers, and yet she'd be drinking these whiskey. And and I remember my father said to me, "You you're twelve years old. You must have been what forty seven? He said you're old enough to take care of your mother." You know, like I was supposed to protect Dorothy. When did you have a feeling that he was going to die early? He talked. He talked a lot about death. When? At the ta at the we only ate with him on Saturdays and Sundays for lunch. We know. Otherwise, we didn't see him very much. And he he said his father told him. You know, his father was a pharmacist, and he was born in Oshawa. Uh, Canada, which is outside of Tor uh, Toronto, it's in Ontario, and he said after his father's mother died in Canada, they were sent away to a boarding school, Pickering College, and he saw his father twice a year, and he kind of reported to him like in the military, and the father was only interested in his grades. Really? Yeah. That was, that was I've heard good. I've heard that from a lot of other Canadian people mm -hmm. at that time. About that time. Well, that, so did you, when, how old were you when Fred Kerr died? Uh, Thirty. No, like uh, sixteen. And do you remember that? Yeah, he died right in front of me. Fred Kerr. No, that you mean my grandfather. Yeah. No, he died before I was born. He died in September 33. And Madeline, his wife, died in uh, June uh, 34. Oh, both before you died? Kind of a year later. No. No. What did Dorothy say about them? Did he like, did she like No, them? I had, I had, uh, my father's first cousins lived on Staten Island, so I learned a lot from them. Then they, they, they their family name was Stewart, S-T-U-A-R-T. What did they say about Madeline and Fred Kerr? I learned a lot from Douglas Stewart. He, he was the soldier that was captured by the Germans in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, he, he got the highest military award in, 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 that the U.S. government gives. It, it was the Silver Star. And he, he joked about how he got it. He was in the invasion of Africa by the Americans in, in November 42. And uh, he was the only one that, that, you know, they had, the, he, he learned French from those Alsatian ants. And he studied German in high school. So he, he had a good grasp of French and German. <clears throat> and he asked for a, a French speaker. And he went with this American captain to, 
They didn't know which, which way the French would be when they invaded North Africa because they were all French colonies like Algeria and Tunisia and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so he asked, the, 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 the head of this regiment asked, who knows the French language? And my cousin raised his hand and, mm -hmm. and he went with an American captain to take the surrender of the French fort with a white flag, you know, it's truce. And so the, when they entered the fort, the French captain, because my cousin spoke French, <laughs> he handed over his pistol to my, to my cousin. And he signed it. And my cousin signed, signed the pay, surrender paper. <laughs> so for that, he got the silver star. He used to joke about it a lot. But then he went home and got married, and they sent him back. You know, he missed the Normandy invasion, but they sent him in December 44 to England, and from England they went to Belgium, and the Battle of the Bulge was in, in Belgium. And there he, he, was, he was experienced with warfare, but then he had raw recruits with him, young guys, you know, who didn't know anything. And the Germans encircled them, and, Is he uh, still alive? He was cut off. Well, yeah, he came out of the war. No, but was he? Is he alive, or did he just die recently? He, he's over hundred. He's a hundred and one or two. He lives. He's in a nursing home in Florida. But he helped me a lot. But what did he tell you about Madeline and friends? Madeline was a, a club woman. Such women were known as club women. They belonged like five or ten different clubs. And, you know, her husband owned his own drugstore, so he had a good income. It was the Kerr drugstore. <laughs> oh, yeah. It still we exists in some parts. No. We saw in Los Angeles. No. Yeah, but that's another oh. family. That's a, 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 it's from a, a southern family. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, and a, 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 a dwarf worked in the drugstores <laughs> making ice cream sodas. <laughs> or Fred, what, what do you say about Fred? What kind of person was he? He came home, he my, my godmother, the, uh, the, one of those Alsatian aunts, mm -hmm. said he, because she ran the Kerr household, mm -hmm. the Kerrs were brought up with five, those five children See, on Hepperton yeah. Avenue. Mm -hmm. and, and Elizabeth Miller ran the household. Mrs. Kerr, Madeline Kerr, was um, a club woman. She belonged to like 10 different clubs, the gardening club, the social club, this club, and that club. And she owned five or four or five different houses. And so she collected the rents. And, and uh, the Kerrs were wealthy compared to their cousins, the Bailey cousins and the Stewart cousins. You see, the Kurds had, a, like, generally a lot of money. They had the best of everything. They had tennis courts in the backyard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you would have loved that. <laughs> Fred Curtin? Yeah. One. My father learned to tennis in the back. In the backyard. And Norman, Norman played a very good game of tennis. Really? Yeah. And my father, I don't know about Kenneth. Kenneth was... Quite athletic and track and f track and field mm. events. That, you know, Phillips. When was the pharmacy sold? I guess when he died in 1933. They didn't want to inherit it. No, there was nobody. They, everybody was a doctor or a dentist. You know, there was no pharmacy. We needed Andrew, your brother. He's a pharmacist. But their dwarf made the ice cream sodas, and his, his name was Squat Mulligan. And when Christine got married, you know, the cook we had, Christine, she got married in a Polish Catholic church, is still there on Staten Island, mm -hmm. <laughs> and everything was in Polish. And they had a big reception, and no, that, that was America in the 1940s. It was a different country. Um, Squat Mulligan came to the wedding, and everybody, you know, the little kids wanted to see if he, if he could reach the urinal in the men's room <laughs> because he was so tiny. <laughs> you know, like, he'd have to step up on a box. <laughs> and the best dancer was a black guy. 
and everybody called him Teddy. And he, he had white spats on, and, and he was out there What's dancing the with all these white women. <laughs> and they all know him. What's I mean, the spat? Shoe. It, it was like a white leather thing over the shoe. But he was the, the best dancer, Teddy. I don't know what his last name was. But Staten Island was unlike the other boroughs. You know, the families went back there to the 17th century. And everybody knew, it was like, it was like one big happy family. Everybody knew everybody. You know, I, I, I think we must have been related to 25 different families because of this intermarriage business. I mean, you know, the names Cro Crocheron, Fontaine, there were a lot of them were, were Mr. Canon, Mr. C Mr. Cannon, we call him, but in French they say Canon. Mr. Cannon lived on Cannon Street. Mm -hmm. And one day my father came to me at, eight, at, at quarter to eight in the morning and he said, oh, your friend died. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do you mean, my friend? And he said, Ms. Mr. Cannon died. Mm -hmm. We went there for so many years, mm -hmm. a house call, and, and I knew the interior of the house from playing there. Mm -hmm. You know, my father would come in and spend, imagine, and a doctor in those days, he visited, visited Mr. Cannon like for 10 years, checked his heart, gave him a shot in the arm of B12. And you know what you got mm -hmm. for that in those days? Three eggs. Three dollars. And you got a cup of coffee and homemade apple pie. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Or I need to take a shower. <laughs> Let's take a break and we'll come back. <laughs>